Hi, I'm Eric Ostro, host of Live at the Lord Town. For season three, we are focusing on the intersection of arts and advocacy. So many off-Broadway artists give back to their communities. This season, we are giving them the opportunity to speak about how and why they chose the causes they devote themselves to and how those causes help make them the people and artists they are today. Good evening, everybody. My name is Eric Ostro, one of the hosts of Live at the Lortel. Um, I want to bring my co-host on because we want to get right to our guest this evening, which is very exciting. Joy D. Michelle, come on on. Hey, darling. How are you? Hey, my love. How are you? I am fantastic and very excited. I know you're excited. This is very <laughs> exciting. I'm going to read a little bit of his bio. Uh, Ruben Santiago Hudson is currently starring in Lackawanna Blues, which he wrote and directed on Broadway at Manhattan Theatre Club. He has also directed the Broadway production Jitney, which garnered several awards for Outstanding Revival, including a Tony Award and six Tony nominations. Uh, Santiago Hudson recently adapted August Wilson's play Ma Rainey's Black Bottom for Netflix, which was uh, produced by Denzel Washington, directed by George C. Wolfe, and starred by Ola Davis, Chadwick Bozeman. Ruben's directing credits include The Piano Lessons, Skeleton Crew, Othello, Gem of the Ocean, Paradise Blue, My Children, My Africa, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Cabin in the Sky, The Happiest Song, Play Last, Two Trains Running, Things of Dry Hours, and more. Mr. Santiago Hudson received a Tony Award as featured actor for his performance in August Wilson's Seven Guitars and made his Broadway debut alongside Gregory Hines in Jelly's Last Jam. Other Broadway credits include Stick Fly and Gem of the Ocean. Select theater credits include The Winter's Tale, Henry VIII, and Measure for Measure, uh, and A Soldier's Play, Lackawanna Blues, East, East Texas Hot Links. Uh, he wrote, executive produced, and co-starred in the HBO film Lackawanna Blues based on his OB and Helen Hayes award-winning play. The movie received many honors, including Emmy, Golden Globe, NAACP, Image Award, Christopher Award, and the Humanity Prize. Let's welcome our incredible guest, Ruben Santiago Hudson. Welcome. welcome. Thank you. you have a very long um, bio, which I'm so happy to read and uh, reminds me of so many things. So welcome, sir. We're so Thank honored you. to have you. I just want to throw out there, I believe it's two Tonys. Is it two Tonys? Yes. yes. Yes, two Tonys. So let's give the brother his flowers. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Didn't get to it. Um, so as of right now, sir, you are currently doing Manhattan Theater Club's Lackawanna Blues. Um, you're bringing a new production back to Broadway. And uh, it's actually a new production. So tell us a little bit about... Um, why you brought this production back and and what's new about it? Well, you know, I, I brought it back um, initially because my my um, uh, my co-creator, Bill Sims Jr. kept saying the, the country needed Nanny again because we were in such turmoil. We was in, we were in such discourse and divided and angry. And uh, Bill said, we need Nanny to tell us it's going to be all right. That's what initiated mm -hmm. And so I said, okay, but I, I needed to, um, since I hadn't done it in 20 years, I needed to find out where my body and my mind and my heart was and how I could do it. And so we uh, we uh, decided to to, um, to test it. And so I called a friend of mine, Mike Ritchie, at, the, at the, the taper in LA and said, Mike, I'd love to bring this play if you have room for me, because you, you're always asking me, when can I come? And I said, I can come now. And he said, come on. <laughs> <laughs> we took it out to LA and had a one, we were received incredibly well. Uh, the people were just amazing. The the the, the um, groups that came, the the youth that came, and so we we had our wings. But unfortunately, uh, Bill didn't make it. He he passed away before I got to the taper. So I had to bring another guitarist in, and uh, who played, who was a wonderful uh, musician. But uh, he didn't make it to um, Broadway with me. I decided to um, to move on from him, and I and I I asked Bill Sims Jr.'s bandmate. Junior Mac, to would he want to take Bill's seat, sit in Bill's chair, and, and he was overwhelmed, and he did come, but I brought it because we needed it, 
and and selfishly i needed it i needed to be reassured uh that no matter what the pandemic did and the the racial discourse in this country did that my mom's spirit would loom over us loom over me and tell me it would be all right and so we brought it back so i went to manhattan theater club you know and uh i asked lynn uh, meadow who had been also beckoning me to come to the theater. I said, mm -hmm. I got lack on the blue. She said, when, what do you want? <laughs> what, how? <laughs> and I mean, it was, it's, it's, you know, it seems simple, but now we talk about a 45 year career. And if it doesn't get a little simpler now, when will it get, you know, simpler? When right. can you, you know, so that's why I brought it, you know, yeah. I forgot. I don't even think I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, sure. You did. I mean, I, I, I think actually what I was, what I wanted to say is, you know, um, still at the heart of Lackawanna blues is, is the same. It's a story of kindness, um, welcoming kindness and, and bringing kindness in and being kind uh, to each other. And after this last two years that we had, I think um, bringing this play black is, is absolutely the right thing to do. Yeah, you know, uh, kindness is part of it. Generosity, grace, uh, humanity. Um, perseverance. Yeah, and also perseverance, very important. Uh, also, um, uh, uh, the influences, w w w the impact that grown people can have, no matter who they are, on a on a child. W what does it mean to to have, uh, I guess, leadership in a way of uh, of authority and uh, love and uh, sensitivity and understanding? You know, I, I'm curious to know because the big takeaway for me when I first saw the show is community and how we stand up and, and how somebody can really take care of each other and uh, be the catalyst to take care of each other and influence other people's lives. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you had gobs and gobs and gobs of stories to tell. How did you select those particular stories to go into the show? Like what was the process of going, now I'm going to leave this one and, and put this one in instead. You know, it would be interesting. It would it would be it would be cool to say that you know you're Ruben, Ruben, Ruben. But it was you know my dramaturg was instrumental, and his, his name was John Diaz. Uh, he's an artistic director at the Two River Theater in, in Red Bank, New Jersey, at this point. But he was my dramaturg at the Public Theater, and he was very clear and sincere to me about asking me questions that were important about this play. What did I need to tell? He, first of all, was what story I wanted to tell, why I wanted to tell it, who was I telling it to, and what I needed to tell it. So there were other things in the play that m m some of my poetry and some of my writing, I think, is more poetic than some of it in there now. But it was I didn't need it for this story, for this moment, to tell this play. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, John and I, uh, uh, as a dramaturg, he gave me structure. Uh, uh, he challenged things uh, that I might do for self-absorption or, or to show off. Uh, and other things he challenged me to show off. You know, you can do that You because you can play harmonica and you can dance and sing. Why not do it here? Is there a point for it? Is there a place for it? You know, he qu questions. And he let me make the decisions I thought were mo most pertinent uh, for Lackawanna Blues, this play that we have right now. The um, Tell me a little bit about when you started it um, years ago, the public, um, you started putting this piece together and and how you realized that it would be an evening of theater and then a film and now back to theater. Well, listen, nothing happens with this play without George C. Wolf saying, yes, I want to commission you. Yes, I want you to do this play. And though George was very busy running an empire at the time at the public <laughs> theater, he didn't have a lot of time to be with me. But the time that he came to me, the once a week or whenever he came, he dropped pearls on me. Mm. You know, John would set up the structure with me and make, let me make my choices. And George would question them or and some of them, you know, we found I'm, I'm, I'll put them in my nightclub act and other things that that I you would would we would debate. And I would say, this is why I need it. And he would say, OK, it's your play. So, you know, George was the catalyst there. But um, in making it happen, somebody had to make me accountable. And George was that person by sending me a damn, uh, a commission, you know, commission. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't take my wife and three kids to lunch on that commission, but that commission <laughs> made me accountable. And then it was pre the prestige of the public theater saying, we want to invest in you mm -hmm. to write this play, no matter how small. And so, uh, uh, that process was over a year 
and and I sat in a room with with many yellow pads because I was writing at the time and I typing the play, a tape recorder and uh, harmonicas and Bill Sims Jr. in the corner with his guitar, and that's that's how we developed it. Found out what we needed to do this with. Now, at the time of putting this together, was your biological mother still with us or had she and Nanny both already passed on? I'm asking that because I'm wondering how did they respond or were you concerned about how family members and community members may respond to the way you told the story? No, Nanny was gone. Nanny Nanny had passed on in 1989. I did this play in 2001. Aileen Hudson, my real mother, was still living then. Uh, as a matter of fact, she died uh, in 2002. So she never saw it. Um, I purposely didn't, uh, sidetrack this play by telling her story, which is an incredible story. And I didn't tell my father, Ruben Santiago's story, which is a, also equally entertaining and wonderful story about an immigrant man that came from Puerto Rico that barely spoke English and, you know, raised a family. And still, though I stayed with Nanny, he remained in my life, uh, and was a father to me every day. You know, I don't put him in the play much and I don't put uh, uh, Aileen. And then one of the most important figures in my life was my godmother, a woman named uh, Maddie Overton. Uh, she was the one who would give me the ugly stick, as she would call it. She was the disciplinarian. Nanny was like, baby, what you want? You know, <laughs> you got it. Here it is. So I needed structure. And Mama Overton, as I called her, mm -hmm. gave me structure. So, you know, I, I, but I focused on the play I wanted to tell, which was Nanny. Nanny's goodness, raising a community and a community helping to raise a child. And also, um, who was the witness? It's the 11 year old boy. And how does these things affect him to create the man that's in front of you now? Um, really um, not wanting to disappoint those people, particularly Nanny and Mama Overton. Uh, I went on to pursue uh, anything I wanted to try. I gave it, I wanted to be better than anybody else at it. And sometime I won, sometime I didn't. But Lackawanna Blues made it to Broadway. Um, I, I, I would love to, there's this quote that you say, the play never leaves me. Your life never leaves you. You can change your suit. You can change your attitude. You can't change your life. What it is, is in the beauty and the turmoil and the pathos and the pain. Who said that? Whoever said that was a cool dude. Who said that? Yeah, very, very <laughs> smart. That's you, sir. You said that. Sometimes I'll be talking, I'll be like, you know, <laughs> where did I come up with, you know, because I speak free. I'm a, I speak from my heart, you know, mm -hmm. even though my mind is connected sometimes, mm -hmm. I sometimes I take a little detour and it's just all heart. Mm -hmm. And at times, you know, when people try to trap me, I'll go intellect, I'll go straight intellect, you know, and because uh, I can see it. You know, my mom Overton used to always say, be careful, son. So you like to speak from your heart. You think everybody likes you because you're big and gullible and country. But, you know, you got to be careful. My nanny would just say, but don't say what you want to say. You know, so mama protected me. But yeah, that's th that quote is I true. I love that quote. Yeah. But yeah. that quote is true. And and sometimes people wear a suit that really isn't them. Mm. They try. They want to impress you. And I've had a good friend of mine, a, a person who I really admire a lot, who's a mentor, say to me, you know, you speak too honest and it's going to always, it's always going to be something that's going to block you because people see you coming. You already said what you feel. All I got to do is look up any interview and it'll tell you who, who I am and what I'm about, what's important to me. And uh, I recently did an interview and somebody asked me a real strong question about another very powerful person in the industry. And, you know, I did not take the person under the under the under the wall and drown them. But I did say, I admire this, but this is where we part ways. And mm -hmm. so that didn't always get accepted because people do when they when they, they look up to see where their name is being mentioned in places and they see who said it, you know. Um, I want to bring it back to Lackawanna for a second, because I know that the show is currently running. And mm. it paused for a second because you had had an accident. And so now here you are back. And I was wondering with how you've been able to give Nanny a life that's going to live on forever, you know, um, how would you feel about someday seeing another young artist doing the role that you've created so you can sit back and see them perform it and you see it take legs um, while you're here with us, you know, instead of waiting, you know, oftentimes our great black artists 
don't get an opportunity to see or celebrate it um, until they don't get a chance to see it. You know, we wait. So would you ever want to see somebody celebrate you and do it in front of you? <laughs> you you asking me at a very sensitive time because I'm doing it right now and I don't I don't see anybody doing it right now but me because and not because of anything that's overly selfish other than the fact that I don't want anyone ever making light of these people. I don't want anyone ever making them clowns or buffoons or characters or cartoons. Uh, every character I play, I, I give the deepest of, of integrity to because that's what they showed me. And mm -hmm. I don't know if I can trust that with somebody else. And so I doubt that, that I would ever see it done by anybody else. You know, I, I, I could maybe sit up and come up with other reiterations of it. Maybe I'll have one person play Nanny who I trust with her. It's my mother. And I'm putting, them, putting her in their hands like I did Epatha. Mm -hmm. And Epatha was glorious in the role. If I can find somebody to play nanny and maybe two other actors to play all the other characters, I'd be interested in maybe, maybe directing that. But I don't mm -hmm. know if I just hand it to somebody because it just means too much to me. And and it would be more than an insult. It would be fighting stuff mm -hmm. if I walked in and saw people making clowns out of these people. <laughs> right. And they're easy to make clowns out of because they 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 said things and did things that were uncommon uh, to the status quo in America. They would say things like I said, you know, talk about the entire state building because they didn't hear things. Most of them were illiterate, so they couldn't read it. They would hear what you said. It's like there was a man in, in our in our neighborhood called, uh, they call him Ulysses. And they, they always say, yeah, Ulysses going to fix so-and-so's car. It, I had to be a grown man before I actually knew his name was Ulysses. <laughs> and that's just the way they say things. Like like yeah. Nanny say, you know, I got I got other parts I ain't even going to talk about. Go on. Yeah. I have Somebody an uncle Maz and his name is Morris, but I didn't know his name was Morris until I was about 30. He was you know, Maz the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> like when, when they called me, when I was nanny had me, when I was little, she, they called me little junior because they had another junior they called big junior. So nanny would say junior, then both of us would come. So she had to distinguish it. Little junior, yeah. big junior. And sometime I go to like one of some people still calling, Hey, little junior. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I was, you know, Ruben Santiago Jr. Speaking of um, Ipatha and, and that performance that she gives, um, which I actually just watched today instead of doing my work, I got That's immersed sure. in, in the play, um, in, in the movie. And um, you're exactly right. That's exactly what I needed to, um, to feel embraced. Um, even though I was not in the film, I had nothing to do with it, but the, um, the mothering and the nurturing and the, um, this archetype of, um, of this woman um, and how she took care of you and, and what she taught you was exactly what I needed today and exactly what I needed to see. Um, her performance is just so magnificent. She was, and, she was uh, brilliant in this role and, and and I was the luckiest writer in the world because I found a person who would embody the grace and generosity in the portrayal of that character. And then also on top of that, add her extraordinary acting prowess. Mm -hmm. She's a bad mama. She knows she yeah. can bring it. And so she knew how to back up off it. You know. And then with George mm -hmm. Wolf's hand on it, you know, his vision, he's a visionary director. You know, that combination was just, um, it was a godsend. Yeah. Can we go back? I want to go back, back, back. And I want to ask you a couple of names and then just get what comes to your mind and what their contribution to your life is, mm -hmm. what has been. Uh, Negro Ensemble and Douglas Turner Ward. See, now I'm going to make, make sure I'm not going to start crying. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm going to try my best. But, you, you know, old men do cry now. You know, yes. when we're young, we don't. It's okay. We like it. Big break in New York. And uh, he passed away uh, maybe uh, six months ago. Um, but we stayed close to the end. Um, and his notes and his, his, the way he worked and the way he did things in the, in the group of actors that he allowed me to be present with, you know, uh, really changed the young actor's life. You know, I would not have met a Robert Hooks or an Adolf Caesar or Francis Foster or a Hattie Winston 
or, or, or you know, I would have never met them or a Denzel Washington or if it would, we're all from, from Doug's, you know, a tree in some way or another. And so many uh, artists and, and designers, like my designer that that that, that did Lackawanna Blues, that, that did Jitney is Karen Perry. That's she's from the Negro Ensemble Company. And so that's how long that arm reaches back. Mm -hmm. um, Doug meant the world to me, you know, and and I did everything I could, you know, to always make sure that I acknowledged, you know, his generosity to me. You know, we had a little thing. He used to like to drink champagne, but he drank so much champagne that he couldn't drink like he couldn't drink the real, the real stuff. He would drink, you know, champagne style, you know, something from America, but, uh, <laughs> you know, not bad stuff, but not the stuff. But every year I knew where he hung out and I would go in the bar and order the best champagne they had and just send it to him. He wouldn't know I was there until he got the bottle. All mm -hmm. of a sudden he'd be drinking. I won't name things because I don't know y'all. You guys sponsor anything. He'd be drinking one thing, and all of a sudden this bottle would come, and this glass would come, and this ice, and he'd be sitting in this bucket. And he'd be like looking around. He knew I was somewhere, and I'd be all the way on the other side, raising the glass every year. Mm. Doug meant a lot to me. Smart man, and he, and he taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, my next one is um, I would love if you could share the story of um, what what August Wilson means to you and how you started directing his shows. August and I, you know, it it it, it morphed from from a mentor program that we were we were dealing to brothers to like brothers because I was the only one that would debate him about my character. I couldn't debate him about other people's character because it's all this play. But my characters that I played, I could debate him all day long and everybody, he's going to fire you, he's going to fire you. <laughs> but we had a respect because we had lived a, it was a certain part of our lives that were very similar. You know, we both biracial. We both uh, spent a great deal of our time in Pittsburgh. He, he grew up there. I went there every summer for the first 17, 18 years of my life because my mother was from Pittsburgh. My grandmother, my whole family, the Hudsons are still in Pittsburgh, Clarendon. So we became, we bonded. And my mother actually knew him when he was a poet and they wanted to put him out of, out of, out of Eddie's restaurant. And they was, she and other people, let him stay, let him stay. We buy him another cup of coffee. So he, he and I bonded. But the work that he laid, that he laid out for generations to, to do, to empower generations of young actors, uh, uh, to not only empower the actors, but to, to make sure that African-American culture was not overlooked and that it took its place in the culture, the culture of canon of any, with everybody else's culture because our culture got dismissed. It wasn't important. The food we cooked, how we ate, how we dressed, how we sang, everything was rudimentary and everything was, oh, that's talent opposed to intellect. Mm -hmm. You know, if we, Michael Jordan scores 65 points, so he's talented. He thinking too, he know when to cross over on the guy. He know this guy's susceptible to this move. Uh, when, when when Ruben Santiago Hudson does uh, a, a cane well, people stand around and say that was easy for him playing. You know, he's a country dude, known from Lackawanna, New York. No, I did not know how to play harmonica. No, I'm not from Mississippi like cane well is. You know, so I did use skill and craft. So August shows the glory and the beauty of being black, as Ozzie Davis used to call it, the secret cup of, he's called blackness, a secret cup of gladness. <laughs> so hanging with people like Ozzy, you know, when I came here, Moses Gunn, you know, mm. people that knew Doug and people from the Negro Ensemble, but August, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, Lloyd Richards. That was my next person. Yay. The doctor, you know, <laughs> because even when me and my brother August would, would, would battle, it was the doctor that kept us together. Yes. You know, it was the doctor in, you know, when August would call me, I mean, he gave me the most, the most incredible, uh, like he asked me to do his one man play. I was the first person and people's done it all over the country and all the people all over the country bragging. Yeah, I did August. Wilson, blah, 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 blah. I'm the man. I just, my play, I do it all over. I'm the one he asked to do it. Out of all them people that's doing it, he asked, August asked mm -hmm. one guy. Now they're doing the hell out of it. I ain't gonna lie to you. They're killing it. But August asked me. So that honor will be with me forever. And so, but Lloyd, his tutelage, his intellect, his integrity, his power, 
his, his kindness. I mean, he was the most generous, patient person. He used to get me mad. He was so patient. I'd be like, I'd be, I know my lines. And I'd be running all over the stage. And other actor be like stumbling. And I'd be looking at him like this. And Lloyd be like, uh, uh, patient. Mm. And he taught mm. me as a director. What he taught me is patience. I'm so was patient your, with my actors. Was and your first was, show with them, was that Seven Guitars? Yeah, but I had been chasing them since 1984. Right, right. <laughs> I've been writing letters and showing up and you know saying I'm Ruben, I'm the guy that's writing you the letters. How can I get in? Uh anybody need coffee? You want me to go get a fish sandwich for you? You know, but, and they finally let me in. And when they let me in, they never let me go. I'm fascinated what you learned from Lloyd um as an actor, and then what you learned from Lloyd as a director. I know you said patience was one, but what about as an actor? As an actor, uh, the thing about Lloyd is he would, as an actor, empower you. He taught me the importance of finding your own way and the options you have in that way. We know what the destination is. What are the layers that got you there? That's Lloyd. What's appropriate in getting to that place? And I say this word, that was a word he used, appropriate. Because a lot of actors like to do things that aren't appropriate choices for that moment. Because they're showy choices or their choice that suits me, but did it suit the moment? Right. So Lloyd always wanted you to find the appropriate choices to layer your performance to get to the destination. He taught me that as an actor. Uh, he he strengthened that in me as an actor because I, I had a lot of talent. I thought I had a lot of talent. I can do things instantly. And he wasn't interested in the instant. Mm. He was interested in how the, that, the instant is the result of something. Like actors would like to cry. If somebody say, man, guess what? Your mother died. <laughs> is that the appropriate response? If, God forbid, you get that phone call and your mother has passed on, the first thing you do is not to cry a bucket of tears, not if you got to go handle some business. You got to go there and see it for yourself to know that it's real, even though you know it's real. Then you got to pick the dress, find a funeral home, get the program together, who the pallbearer is going to be, who going to divvy up the debtor estate. Was it together? You got to do a lot of things, uh, you know, and, and so the first thing ain't tears. The first thing is now this world is that empty without her. My life is so empty without her. So what's the next right move? So, you know, don't go to the acting move, go to the appropriate move, the real move, the mm -hmm. real response. Mm -hmm. And does Lloyd um, help you as help you as an actor find that for yourself? He, by asking you questions, he's not going to tell you nothing. Right. He'll yeah. ask you questions, the same doggone question until you give the result. He wants. Mm -hmm. Until yes. you give the result. And, and there, like, 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 for instance, if 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 I wanted to, 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 if 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 I tell somebody I'm gonna go over here and pick up this shovel, but I go over near the shovel and there's a knife there and I'm mad at another man, I pick up the knife. Everybody know me and the man just had an argument and I go pick up the knife for a second and look over at him and put it down. You know, Lloyd would ask you, "What was that you picked up?" And that means don't pick it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you would say, "Oh, oh, I got, I got the shovel." Yeah, yes, but. Before you picked up the shovel, you you picked up something. Uh, yeah, but I went to get the shovel. What did you pick up? Uh, picked up the knife. Okay. That's what he say. Okay. That means don't do it. <laughs> Next time I go there, I don't pick up the knife. Even though I picked up the knife. <laughs> right. What do you think your big takeaway was from him as a director? Now that you're directing, are there any uh, Lloydisms that you've brought into your work? His quotes, his quotes, his style is completely different than my style. My, I'm all, I'm, I'm like energy, energy, you know, focus, focus, focus. Boom. Lloyd would sit back like this the whole time and say, I'm going to the theater today. And I'm like, but I still don't tell actors what to do. I do like Lloyd. I ask you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get it, but you say what I did. I'm a I'm a smash to be honest with you I'm a I'm I'm smash together of Lloyd Doug, and and George, I'm a and then I develop my own style from that, 
And uh, it's a little bit of each of those three. Mm -hmm. And what do you do as a director, if you don't mind me asking, if if you're not getting what you, in a moment, what you're not getting from an actor? Sometimes it don't happen in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I've run into situations where I said, man, how can I make this work? You know, so I really think about it. And I sit back and I figure out what is the journey to get me there to for this actor? You know, um, most of the time it's not acting. It's sometimes it's attitude. Sometimes I have to change an actor's attitude. And, you know, like maybe they're a little too aggressive in the fight or maybe they're just too in the corner all the time and not part of the group. Mm -hmm. So I figure, or maybe they, you know, um, do, they could be doing something that I, I really want to change that habit to make that a better actor and make that actor work better for my play. Because I'm always going to hire good people. They're always good people. But every actor has habit. Every, every human being has habits and things that sometimes don't. And sometimes, I, I, you know, I talk to them. Sometimes I have to pull them privately and I find out what they need. See, that's, mm -hmm. that's where a lot of directors go wrong. They want to tell actors something and make them do something, but they don't ever find out what actors need. Sometimes you have to ask them, you, you know, I noticed that, you know, when we are having our, our, our lunch, you sit way, way in the corner by yourself mm -hmm. all the time. You never, you never come in part of the community. I need you to be a part of the community. What, what, what do you need? And then they'd be like, yeah, well, that's the way I work. I like to work in the corner by myself. I say, that's cool. You know, but in, when we in the room, in my room, I like community. So I want you to come, you know, if not, we gonna come over and sit with you at least a couple of us every day, you know, just to make you feel comfortable. Or sometimes I just go over there myself and then finally, come on, come on, let's go, let's go, you know, or just finding out each actor is a human being and you have to be effective with each human being in a different way. Mm -hmm. and, you, and it's your job as a director to find out how to be effective, mm -hmm. you know. That's just my, my thing. I mean, I work with directors don't think that. They think, right. like, no, this is my way and that's it. Mm -hmm. so you have to be what right about the there. audition room? What about um, someone comes in? I mean, I know auditioning, at least for me, when, when I was acting, it was the most terrifying thing to go in to audition. And I was a horrible auditioner. So what is it no. you do in an audition room that can make an actor feel comfortable? Or what are you, what are you expecting to walk in? Well, the first thing I do is get up. I don't sit behind a desk. I sit on the side and I get up when the, every actor comes in, I'm up, I go to them. And before COVID, I would give them, if I knew them, I'd give them a hug. If I didn't know them, I'd shake their hand and look in their eye. And first thing I say is thank you. Thank you for, for, for you know, taking the time to come and, and share some of your talent with us. And that's unusual because I've, I've done a hundred plays. You know how many auditions I've done? Nobody does that, <laughs> rarely. No. So I say thank you. I want them, I want to treat them the way I want it to be treated. And I say thank you. And I, and um, and then I ask them, you know, I let everybody introduce themselves. So I introduce them and I, I give them a smile, you know, and I always remind them, you know, take your time. You know, if there's anything you need, you, you know, any questions you want to ask, you want some water, whatever you whatever you need, uh, let us know because this is your time, you know. And sometimes I have to walk up to an actor, my back to the producers and not let them know when I'm talking to an actor sometime and I say something to them, particularly if an actor is like losing it, they're falling on their face. I'll go over to them and say, hey, Quit trying to impress people. Quit trying to impress us. Mm -hmm. If we wasn't impressed, you wouldn't be here. Yeah. Right. We're impressed. Find out what this character wants right now and show me how you're going to get it. You know, and actors appreciate that. And when they when they finish, I thank them. You know, sometimes I've had casting directors say to me, why you spend so many much time with that actor? You know the actor wasn't going to get the role. We knew from the first time they read that they weren't right. And I say, well, I don't want, I want that actor to leave better than when they came in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So every actor that comes in, I give 20 minutes. Right. <laughs> you know, it's funny because my daughter was an actor. Yeah. My daughter's on a TV show called La Brea uh, on NBC. And uh, that's a little plug for her. Her name is Lily Santiago. My son is Trey Santiago Hudson. And he's a really wonderful young actor. But my daughter went into an audition and she was so excited to meet this one director. And uh, the casting director said to her before she walked in, he does not look up. He does not say hello. Don't look at him. Automatically, the girl's not going to get the role. She's thrown already. And she walked mm -hmm. in. She's scared to look in over, over that side of the desk where he is. And, and the other people, the producers in the room, hello, hello. You know, and he didn't. I said to myself, I said, I wish I could come in and slap him in the mouth. Mm 
You know, what you didn't look up at all. No, mm. Woody Allen did that to me <laughs> when I auditioned for him. He was hiding in the room in the back and he came, peeked out around the corner and ran back. I said, what was that? <laughs> Catch him. Catch him. <laughs> I, I don't understand it. I mean, <clears throat> but that's everybody got their own lane. They stay in their lane. I stay in mine. So he was hiding in the corner. He was in a room watching it on video, but he oh. wanted to see me in person. I guess so he came out. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> little head peeking out of it. Your brother, your brother, go in the room and it's all dark and it's a little hallway down this minute. Peek out, you be like, <laughs> I don't know what's up, you know. So I have a question um, for you in terms of like the the state of theater where we are right now. Um, yeah, I know, right? Um, often time, I'm, I'm gonna take a I'm gonna take a risk. I'm going out there. Um, you know, I'm gonna tell the truth. So why are you gonna get me in trouble? Because I want to hear the truth. <laughs> um, you know, we know that oftentimes um, television will use us to as a defibrillator you know we'll we'll come and get a network going and then all of a sudden all the black shows are gone so right now we're back and broadway is black and um do you see this being something that can be consistent that we actually have representation and that not just broadway regional theater companies just a, just across the board will start to really um, want to tell our stories or are we just being a defibrillator right now? I know I went there. Be, be careful with what you answer because I know, you know. Listen. Answer any way you like, my friend. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any fear of the truth. The truth is the truth. Mm -hmm. How can, how can, why would Broadway, which was built by a very small group of very influential, very powerful, very wealthy white people. Why would they give us seven plays again? They won't be, they won't be, first of all, they put seven black plays out here coming out of a pandemic when they didn't even know when or how people would come back in the theater. Do you think we're going to succeed? Those numbers, no matter how nice and, and good they may look, particularly in the commercial venues, they're in trouble. Because you will never recoup your money on a 14-week run unless you got Denzel. Never. So why would they? They have never done seven female plays on Broadway dramas. They have never done seven Jewish plays on dramas at the same time. They have never done seven Hispanic, seven gay, seven nothing. Never, except seven white plays. So what I'm hoping, because there was a time and many times in the history of Broadway, there's not one black play on, not one. And you can count on like two fingers if you chop off the other ones when it was two dramas that were black running at any, for any cons consistent amount of time, any formidable amount of time. Two, never, never for a long time, never. Seven are here. So so this is what I want to say. What I want to ask my, uh, you and everybody, what does that mean? They, they, they responded to a, a basically a total uproar of, of tens of thousands of black artists saying, let us in. They had no choice. And some of them had a heart. And some of them said, y'all right. But you think they're going to do that again? <laughs> I mean, really, you know, listen, Manhattan Theater Club, roundabout, um, second stage, uh, Lincoln Center have, they're called, they're uh, not-for-profit theaters. I mean, they get sponsors, they get grants, they get uh, distribute contributors, they get different people to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, commercial theater and do that, they have investors. Right. What do investors invest for? To make money. 85% of the dramas do not make money, period. White, black, or otherwise, don't recoup. Now we talking business. So why would you keep investing money 
on a proposition that ain't that ain't making money unless you're not for profit and you're just trying to draw your audience and that's a long way of answering that so this is what i'm hoping because people have asked me a lot of questions because I'm, I'm probably the probably one of the strongest big-headed guys out here big big mouth that's talking this is what i'm talking nobody can tell you what i'm just telling you. nobody will tell you what i'm just telling you most people don't know what i'm telling you i do what i would love to see is one of these broadway theaters dedicated to artists of color whether it's native yeah. american plays black plays latino plays chinese asian uh, korean one of them that's what it's going to be so if you come to broadway so to be just at least one play there of color and the rest of the theaters can do what they want to do. They can have Tina and they can have Ain't Too Proud and they can have Lack of Wanna Blues too. And they can have Trouble in Mind too, you know? But that one, you go, you know, if you come, you bring your butt to New York and you say, where I'm going to go, if you're a person of color and you want to see color, that theater. Yeah. Now, wouldn't it be interesting also if one if it was a theater that did, because there's no other, no black, no playwrights have written more of all of us BIPOC, maybe Latin, maybe Latin playwrights. But black playwrights have written a bigger body of work. Yes. So you can take one Broadway theater like and, and run and say, I'm going to do three black plays a year. That's a whole different way of looking at it. And you still have a international house, you know, international color of all, all of us. So either, anyway, that ain't going to happen. You know, they, be, they hope Ruben died before that happened, you know, but I'm going to talk and I'm going to say it. But uh, <laughs> my job at the Manhattan Theater Club is to make sure that they are true to the things they say they want to make and do. And that's what they've been doing. I sit in the meetings and we talk and I say things that aren't easy to accept all the time. But but the good news is they have been saying, okay, how do we make that happen? How do we get the money to make it happen? How do we get the people to make it happen? How do we get the spaces to make it happen? And let's start making it happen. And they incrementally have done the things that I thought would show us a fairer, more inclusive, wonderful, wonderful theater. And we're climbing that way. How long I'll be there for that, I don't know, but I'm making sure that as, as I leave the door, uh, as I leave that door, when I walk out, it'll stay open. Mm -hmm. I don't close it behind me. I don't need another chair at the table on Broadway. I need a bigger table. So the chair is permanent. Anyway, that's a long answer. Well, and thank God thank for you. these non-for-profits, Manhattan Theater Club, MCC um, roundabout that have, you know, uh, made a lot of money through donors, et cetera, and opening their doors for these plays and are they now on Broadway. They haven't always mm -hmm. come on now. Well, now what they I'm saying always. is now they are now they are. Now they, they you better. Know, I, I'm a I'm a back of the day crossroads baby. So mm -hmm. um my question to you is I, I know that we over the years have talked about, you know, this is, I, I was there in Crosswords, you know, had the big gold doors and, you know, like, you know, the whole back in the day heyday. Um, but we've all talked about doing our own theater companies, but they don't always come to fruition or they don't last. If you, there's, so, now we've got people in positions, multiple people in positions that could really make an international kind of theater company happen. What would, what do you think it would take? What kind of partnerships do you think it would take to really make something move forward and not just talk about it? Cause I'm not about the conversation of what you're going to do for me. I'm about the conversation of how can we do for ourselves? So what do you think it would take? For the first thing we have to raise is the level of integrity of what we're doing. It's a lot of stuff that's really, really mediocre. I hate to put it that way. And we accept tell it because we're hungry. Shame we're hungry. Devil. Go ahead and tell it. We're hungry for representation. We want to see ourselves and we will support it. But we need to raise, and the way we raise the level of that integrity is, is by, by elevating the people who are ready to do that kind of work but don't have the wherewithal, the funds. Second of all, we, the people, the, the people of color and power, and we got a lot of money in this country. We spend trillions of dollars 
in the, in the in African American community. The Latin community even spends equal or more. Theater has to become important to you. It's not that important to them because it's not a big money making venue. Theater don't make a bunch of money. You know, you got to be running a play for 14 years, like 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 Wicked, uh, 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 something like that, to really make some money. Lion King, you making money, and plays don't run that long. So 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 the average plays you got like Hamilton plays is making two million dollars a week. How many plays are doing that? Not not many. So people have no no impetus to want to throw their money into theater because they ain't making money. What they got to do is stop what's making money. Let's start thinking. You making your money in all kind of other venture capital things. We have to preserve our culture. We have to be custodians of our culture. And theater has to become important. Theater writers, playwrights are, are the most, because they have the most freedom. You don't have as much freedom in film. I write film. You don't have no freedom. You got six people that you don't never met in your life telling you what you should be doing. They don't even know these people the way you know them. Theater is where the writer has their heart and tongue and their mind in. So we have to, we have to su support those writers, support those venues. And, and, and it's not important to these billionaires in our, in our community. I call them every time I have a play. And then I call white people and the white people be like, when you coming? Hmm. We, hmm. Because even if I'm not making money, the glory that I bring with it, the prestige that I bring with me, the integrity that I bring with me, the level of commitment that I bring with me, they want that with them. They chose me now. And once you get to another a level, they always choose you. Other people, why don't my people choose me? Mm. The billionaires. Why can't I get them on the phone? I've been here for 45 years as a writer, director, and actor. Name, name the one that is doing what I'm doing and has gained the prestige that I've gained in each one of those levels. They coming. Trust that. They coming. And, and I cannot wait for these brothers and sisters to, to get there. But either they directing, acting, and writing, or they're writing and directing, or they're acting and writing. But I'm writing. Just wrote my Rainey's Black Bottom. And, they, and I, mm -hmm. they just asked me, you know, they keep on asking. I'm saying I can't write every year. I'm directing. And I'm acting. And I'm, in, and I'm in demand in all three of those places because I'm at the, that level of the integrity of it. I need my theaters to raise the level of integrity. You know, don't just push it out there if it ain't ready. Get it ready. What happened to the process? What happened to the process of, of, of refining? Talent is one. We all got talent. I was, the, the talent I have now, I was born with it. I didn't gain it. I didn't grow it. I didn't buy it. I honed it. People took the time you named Lloyd, George, uh, 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 August, Doug, those people, John Diaz helped me on and on and on. People helped to hone the talent I had and reveal it. I didn't know I could do that, but you can do it. Yeah. You know, and let me show you, but that's, you know, they honed this talent. We have to consider and always take time to, to be as fine as we could be, not rush out there. And it takes time. Lackawanna Blues, 20 years to get to Broadway. 20 years. They got plays that that that, that just came straight to Broadway. <laughs> like, be like, okay, you know. But uh, I, I want to lift the integrity of what we're doing. And, and that's why the directors who who train under me, the directors who mentor, who, who are my mentees, the directors who, who are my associates, they understand how important this is to me because we're the gatekeepers of what tomorrow's people are going to think and know who we are. Black people, who we are. They're not going to know on TV because on TV, I'm going to show you this much mm. because that's what, that's all they need. That's all they want. If I show you more than that, they're going to cut it. Right. If I show my wife, I love her. They're going to cut it. They're going to let me be in the room with her. If I show my son, I'm proud of him to hit a home run. Have you seen me do that? In 45 years, I've told one woman I loved her. I told one child, I'm proud of you in 45 years you know, on TV and film. But on the stage, Nanny just told me she loved me. Did I freeze? Okay, there we go. Yeah, we all did for a minute, but that's okay. Can you repeat what you just said, Ruben? I can't. 
Okay, that's okay. It came out of my heart. I, yeah, it was a straight thing, download. And I was mad. I was, thing, I was missing. I was like, I'm missing yeah, the download. I was missing it. Yeah. Well, the last thing that I said, y'all heard me say that I never told a woman I loved her except once. Yes, correct. We heard that. Yes. And I've never told a child I was proud of them. Correct. Yes. In Lackawanna Blues, Nanny tells me that she loves me, mm-hmm. and she also tells me I am proud of you. Yeah. And those things are what make a child feel worthy of every inch of ground that they stand on and mm-hmm. every step they take. They carry that pride and they carry that love with them. And that makes them accountable. That I'm proud of you goes a long way. Mm-hmm. And a that really I love you. Way. And that I love you. People don't think people of color, <laughs> we, we show love. They just think we angry or authoritative. That's what they like on TV and films. Yeah, you get in here and you do this and you do that. Well, I'm mad at you. No, I love you. That's important. You know, black love is is scary to some folks. So because it looks too much like right, it looks too much just like them. Hopefully, they have that kind of love, and that makes us equal. Mm-hmm. Wow. Talk to me a little bit about uh, Ma Rainey's and the process of of taking the the play and um, writing a screenplay for it and and what that process was like for you as a writer. Yeah, it was a long process. You know, originally it was at HBO. And so I was dealing with a set of ex- executives there who mm-hmm. once we switched to Netflix, you know, I had a different set of executives. The one constant was George and Denzel. So I always mm-hmm. had them with me. So, um, but yet the person I carried with me the closest was August. So what I was making sure that I did was um, represent what I felt August would want. I don't know what he would want other than the hundreds and hundreds of days and hours that we spent together. So from that, I, I could deduce what was important to him and, and, and make sure that I, you know, implied what I felt was his feelings and kept it in the movie. Also, I had great, you know, with George, I had great guidance. I had great uh, feedback. And with Denzel the same way, you know, so, uh, but they did also give me the room to write the movie that I felt was, was, was August's movie. And the artists, I mean, the actors. But will this be very clear? August wrote the play. And that's what I was honoring. Right. Right. I wrote the movie. He didn't write this movie. So a lot of times, because I say, I'm writing August. People forgot, and, and, and my publicist might have said you might have blew your <laughs> blew, blew your uh, nomination because people then realized that you mm-hmm. really wrote that movie. From this, is your, this is your screenplay. Yeah, it turned it from these two rooms that are in the play to a world. Right. But I had to get back into those two rooms because that's where the play is set. In mm-hmm. that confinement, how do we take advantage of that confinement? Where's the combustible? combustion of, of men sweating in a place in the summer in Chicago and we got to be in here and get something done. Mm-hmm. So I use that. You know, George and I pushed that too, you know, but I had to write a movie, not a play. Yeah. Well, you did a phenomenal job. It was- they did a phenomenal job. Those actors, yeah. you know, those, yes. those, those designers. Yes, and, sir. But they get, I, but I had to give them something. I had to give them something to work with. Well, they ain't got no job. They ain't, they ain't what you design it ain't no script. Yes, sir. But tonight we're focusing on you, and your screenplay was incredible, and uh, was a great reflection on the great August Wilson. And you you created something magnificent. Thank you. Really. What are you? Are you currently working on writing anything now? And currently, I know you're working on skeleton crew for direction, but in terms of what are you writing, what can we look for? I'm writing a movie that I would be my direct directorial debut. Uh, at least we planned that. Um, uh, it's a wonderful movie about a young man finding his way in New York, who's an artist and really is, is being torn, trying to find out who he is. He was raised very fortunate, <clears throat> a little black kid, a man, young man, in a very, in an environment that, he, kind of didn't give him an identity. And so he finds his way into the, trying to find his way into the arts world in New York and find out who he is so he can express himself and what he feels would free him to be, to say what is in his heart that he really doesn't know. And so I'm writing this movie. It's really, um, 
it's really been difficult because of the pandemic. It's been a hard time to write. So it's a lot of stop and go, but I'm getting close to the end of it. And then I'll do Skeleton Crew. And then I also want to say I have an incredible uh, um, play with a lot of music. It's not a musical, but a lot of music uh, by a, a Mexican writer uh, named Karen Zacarias. It's called Destiny of Desire, which will be on Broadway <clears throat> next year. But we're going to the Guthrie to do a pre-Broadway tryout after Skeleton Crew, right after Skeleton Crew. And then we'll bring it back in probably late summer, early fall. Uh, Destiny of Desire. It's a beautiful play. Uh, Ricky Gonzalez is composing. Who's Mark mm -hmm. Anthony's, you know, man. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, Lorna Ventura is the choreographer. Oh, it's just, it's just, it's going to be, and, you know, I bring my Karen Perry with me. And uh, <laughs> we're going to have a great time with that. Go ahead, Joy. We're almost out of time. Why don't you ask your last question? Um, what would you like to see? Um, the change be for the state of theater? Um, what's your hope? One, we... one, of my, one of my hopes is I hope that we can collectively come together as people of color and, and begin to build our own and, and quit, quit getting, you know, having to need other people's permission to do what we want to do. And Broadway is the most visible theater venue in the, in, 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 the, in the world. And so that name, that brand, Broadway, we do need that right now because in Paris and in Japan and in Jakarta and different places, uh, we don't know off-Broadway. And they don't know off-Broadway off or this great work that they're doing downtown or uptown in Harlem. But what they do know is Broadway and that brand, we have found our way in and we need to capitalize on that brand but more than anything, we have to build our own brand, yes. you know, and I need the people of any people with, with, that really have the wherewithal to start really considering the importance of, of, of theater, because that's where the story, the greatest stories are told, you know, and you could turn them into films and you can do big sci-fi films and people jumping over 20 buildings if you want, but human, human stories come, come a lot out of theater. Yeah. You know, oh, I, I forgot to um, mention you have a, um, a school or something named I have art center. To talk about that and how people can know more about it. And yes. if you guys, you know, if there's a well, website or anything, it's an art center. It's called the Ruben Santiago Hudson Fine Arts Learning Center. It's at Global Concepts. There's the WW down there. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful facility that we, that we built from the ground up. And we teach the, the you know, young people the, the, the transformational power of art how you can express yourself. You don't have to be fighting. You don't have to be shooting. You, you can go in there and tap it out, write a poem, write a rap. You know, you can paint it. You can photography. You can do, you know, we have, we, we they offer everything. And it's with a wonderful, wonderful charter school called Global Concepts. Just amazing people that are running that. I'm very proud. Shout out to my man, Tracy McGee there. And uh, um, Dewan Jones, whose father was instrumental in keeping me off the street, Pearly Jones. Mm. But, but I give my heart and soul to that. And also I have a black arts Institute in, in Brooklyn at the at the Billy Holiday Theater, where, where Stephen McKinley Henderson, Felicia Rashad, Michelle Shea, and and Sister Sonia Sanchez, we developed this program as well in New York. Wow! Thank you. And how can we find out about that? What is? It's called. It, it's the it's at the Billy Holiday Theater, uh, uh, and it's called the, the Black Arts Institute. Some people call it the 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 Black Arts. Uh, uh intensive <laughs> we, but yeah you can find that uh uh pretty easy we do two sessions we do a winter session for two weeks we bring in 35 actors from all over the country and we do a summer session for five weeks is there a, a website what, or anything that we can put up um and i'm asking because i know a, i talked to michelle about it a little bit we and got she it was here there it is me. man you. they popped it up there y'all man yeah, i love it quick perfect and can, can you talk about like the benefit of it for young artists? Because the way she described it to me, I was like, when I was young, I wish that existed. So can you who, who, who talk about it what that, Michelle who Shea. Michelle. Michelle, th listen, I, I speak at conservatories all over this nation. Not one you know, has, you know, they'd be calling me in. And the black kids come to me and they'd be like, man, where can I learn more about you? Because I want to... People are teaching our black students, our BIPOC students to fit in because that's comfortable to them. And what they do is they end up losing who they really are. They lose the songs their grandmother sang. They lose the hymns that they heard in church. They lose the cooking, the style, the smells from their mother's kitchen. They forget about that because they want to fit in. 
So we remind them of what the blues is, remind them what their history is, remind them of their responsibility and accountability to their ancestors. We remind them that we all have blood from Africa in us, you know, and so those songs are still deep in us. And when we wear lime green and orange, that there's some time we going back to Kente cloth. I mean, we going back, we going black back, you know, to Kente. Uh, it's like, we want to remind them of the African in them. So we'll bring Sweet Honey in the Rock. We'll bring uh, Michael Eric Dyson. We'll bring uh, uh, Sister Sonia Sanchez. We'll bring uh, 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 Dr. Eddie Glaude. You know, we talk about the history. We can, we'll bring in Alice Walker. We'll bring in the dance companies, uh, uh, Ronald uh, K. Alexander and the other dance companies, uh, Donald Bird and, you know, uh, uh, Desola Osaka Lumi, a teach popping and locking. And mm -hmm. we want all the things that belong to us. To We need to maintain them and grow. Yeah, learn how to fit in, learn how to do Shakespeare, learn how to do Ibsen, but keep what you got. Don't trade in what you have because yes. it's valuable. Eric, I think you're muted. You're being poetic, but you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We have something from the audience, which we're going to close out on from an S. Rhodes. Uh, thank you, sir, for your honesty and transparency today. It is truly inspiring. Is there an artist you'd like to work with, young or old, that you would like to work with? And if so, why? I really would, would, would um, you know, this is the last chapter of my career, however long it is, 10 years, five years, two months, I don't know. But I, I don't really have a whole lot of goals yet. I'm always eager to find out what tomorrow brings and, and who God puts in front of me and, mm -hmm. and puts our lives together. So, yeah, it's a lot of wonderful talent out there. So I wouldn't single out one. OK, well, um, sir, I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sharing this hour with us. It, it flew by and it was um, I learned so much and we are so honored here at Live with the Lord Tell to bring you on and, and talk about this all. Um, uh, Joy, you want to say a last minute thing? Um, just thank you. And um, I'm excited to have been able to spend this time with you. And I look forward to working with you at some point. I know it will happen. <laughs> that would be wonderful. The, know that, that Lackawanna Blues is there till, till uh, November 12th. Right. And I, and I yeah, welcome everybody to club. please come. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I know the tickets are getting real tight in the first these first two weeks, next two weeks. That last week just went on sale. Jump on the last week. Mm -hmm. no. right. <laughs> and, and thank you guys so much yeah. for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So much. Thank you, sir. That is our show. Next Monday, November 1st, Joy and I will interview Jessica Bosk. Jessica will be making her Carnegie Hall debut later this month in my golden age we will talk about that her upcoming concert in london and her experiences on and off broadway we will also talk about involvement in a is for artists dedicated to advocacy reproductive rights and ending the stigma against abortion care then on november 8th john andrew and i will interview the luminescent judith light i am so excited about this interview miss light is currently in production of Julia, a new HBO series on Julia Child. We will talk about her amazing theater career as well as her long advocacy for LGBTQ and rights. More information about these and future guests and how to attend one of our recordings can be found on our website, livewiththelordtell.com. Thank you for joining us. Remember, get vaccinated, wear a mask, and be safe. We hope to see you all in the theater soon. Have a wonderful night and thank you to our audience and especially thank you to Ruben. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Good night. Good night all. <laughs>